Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories is a very strange game. For those who are unaware, Chain of Memories is the direct sequel to the original Kingdom Hearts. It's an intermediary title that's meant to establish characters and ideas that are important for Kingdom Hearts 2. The catch is that Chain of Memories was initially released exclusively for the Game Boy Advance, so if you didn't own the platform or just thought Chain of Memories was an inconsequential spin-off, then you'd be out of luck. However, in 2008, Square Enix attempted to rectify this decision by remaking the game from the ground up for the PlayStation 2. This is the version of the game that's included in all of the HD collections. Since it's the most accessible way to play Chain of Memories, it's the version I'll be using for the basis of this video. I have a very love-hate relationship with Chain of Memories. It's a game that's filled to the brim with a lot of interesting ideas. However, in execution, some of this potential is squandered due to a lack of commitment in some story elements and gameplay issues that are rooted at the core of its design. I don't hate Chain of Memories like most people seem to do, but it's a heavily flawed experience. In order to to properly explain why, I'm going to have to analyze this game from top to bottom. This means that there are going to be major spoilers throughout this video for the original Kingdom Hearts, as well as Chain of Memories. If you haven't played either and don't want to be spoiled, then I suggest you click off the video now and come back once you finish the games for yourself. Who knows, you might even have different thoughts about this polarizing game than I do. But before we get started, I'd like to give a special shout out to today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. At this point, we've all heard of Raid Shadow Legends. It's one of the most popular mobile RPGs that hosts over 600 different champions for you to choose from. But did you know that Raid also features a wide variety of powerful and challenging boss battles? I want to highlight one of my personal favorites, Sylvania, Guardian of the Spirit Keep. Sylvania was betrayed by the elves of Aravia during their cultural renaissance and her family suffered because of it. After that, she went off on her own and doesn't want to share the magic of the spirits with anyone. Sylvania's boss battle revolves around managing her passive regeneration and attacks that deal bonus damage based on her remaining HP. If you want to stand a chance, you need to make sure you bring one or two champions that can apply healing reduction debuffs and another champion that can remove enemy buffs. My favorite part about Raid is that it has far more depth and strategy than any other mobile RPGs I've tried. Each champion has their own unique skill set and role into play in your team, meaning that you can come up with all sorts of compositions that fit your playstyle. The big update for this month is the Guardian Ring. It's a huge feature that gives you plenty of new ways to use your champions, get legendary champions that you missed out on, and an entirely new way to upgrade your favorite ones. If you want to get a head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan my QR code, and you'll get an epic hero Chinoru who's amazing in the Doom Tower, 200,000 silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Once again, thank you so much to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring today's video. Anyways, our story begins right where we left off in Kingdom Hearts 1. After defeating Ansem and sealing the door to Kingdom Hearts, the worlds that were consumed by the darkness are returned to their former states. A consequence of this is that Sora is once again separated from his childhood friends, with Riku being left on the other side of Kingdom Hearts alongside King Mickey, and Kairi being sent back to Destiny Island. Not all hope is lost, however, since while traveling down a winding road, Sora, Donald, and Goofy come across Pluto, who's holding a letter with the King's seal. With spirits high, the trio chases the dog off into the horizon, where they eventually come across this mysterious castle. Once inside, they're confronted by this unknown man in a black coat and are given a rundown on the situation. It turns out that this place is known as Castle Oblivion, and just by stepping inside, the group has lost all of their previous abilities. The hooded man tempts Sora and the gang to go deeper into the castle, but to do so, the group must also follow the rules of the castle. Sora is given a deck of cards that represents his past memories, and in order to ascend the castle, he'll need to revisit his memories. With each each floor that the trio ascends, they'll lose some of their old memories. However, they believe that this risk is worth taking since they have a gut feeling that their missing friends are somewhere within the castle. This is the basic setup to Chain of Memories. As Sora, Donald, and Goofy explore Castle Oblivion, they run into this group known as Organization 13. They act as the game's central antagonists, and they plan on using Sora for their own malicious goals. While the setting and characters are more complicated this time around, the overall narrative is still pretty straightforward. The main meat of the story comes from Sora's interactions with Organization 13, and how the memory loss of Castle Oblivion slowly starts to take a toll on the trio. In between all this, Sora and his friends travel through the worlds that were featured in Kingdom Hearts 1. The game attempts to change things up a bit by making the theme of memories prevalent throughout most of these worlds, but the execution is a bit mixed. However, I want to save that discussion for later. Unlike the original game, there are actually two campaigns this time around. Once you finish Sora's story, you unlock Riku's campaign titled Reverse and Rebirth. This story follows Riku's own journey through Castle Oblivion 
starting us off in the castle's basement and making our way to the exit. It's a much shorter campaign and is used to fill in the gaps featured in Sora's story while also developing Riku as a character. But before I go into more detail regarding that, I want to cover the gameplay first because it's easily the most contentious part about this game. What makes Chain of Memories stand out from the other entries is its card-based combat system. To give a quick rundown on the basic mechanics, each action you take in battle is represented by one of the cards in your deck. There are Keyblade cards that act as your basic attacks and can be chained together in a 3-hit combo. Magic and Summon cards let you cast the spell or summon the character that's listed. Item cards allow you to reload specific cards into your deck. And finally, there are Friend cards that periodically appear on the battlefield. Much like Summon cards, Friend cards allow you to bring an ally into battle to perform an action, but they don't need to be equipped into your deck. Every card in the game is given a numbered value from 0 to 9. This determines the card's priority in combat. If the enemy plays a card with a low value, then you can interrupt their attack by playing a card that's an equal or greater value. However, zero cards work a bit differently. What makes these cards unique is that zero cards can break any card values, but when they're on the field, any card can break a zero card. Card breaking is an essential mechanic to the combat system, and it's required to master if you want to stand a chance against most enemies. This applies to bosses especially, since they usually play high-valued cards and are prone to spamming slights. Slights are basically your special attacks. You can stack up to three cards to play in quick succession, with their total value being the sum of all cards used. Normally, this just has Sora perform all the actions in quick succession, but if you meet the right requirements, you'll be able to activate a special move. For example, if you stack magic cards in a slight, you'll upgrade their effectiveness. Blizzard will go to Blizzara and eventually to Blizzaga if you have enough copies of the card in your deck. The same rule applies to summon and friend cards, but the most interesting and powerful slights are the ones that require more specific card combinations. It's through slights that you're able to gain access to Sora's old limit breaks, such as Sonic Blade, Ragnarok, and Ars Arcanum. But there are plenty of new special attacks that were introduced in Chain of Memories that are just as flashy and effective. Arguably a bit too effective, but just one step at a time here. The catch is that the first card used in a slight combination cannot be reloaded into the deck without the use of an item card. When it comes to the basic mechanics of Chain of Memories, that's honestly all you need to know. While it is drastically different from the game that came before it, I find the ideas on offer very creative and interesting in their own ways. Kingdom Hearts 1 was a game that prioritized player's skill above all else. While there certainly was an element of strategy involved with the combat system, such as the way you can customize Sora's abilities, at the end of the day, this mattered a lot less compared to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Chain of Memories, on the other hand, has a much larger focus on strategy while also still requiring the player's reactions to be up to snuff. This is facilitated through the deck-building system. At any point while exploring, you can pause the game and start customizing your deck. Each card in the game costs a certain number of card points to place in your deck. This cost will vary between the card's class and individual value. For example, while high potion cards function the exact same regardless of numbered value, the lower card will cost less CP to place in your deck. While this means you could potentially fit more cards into your deck, you're also opening yourself up to having your low-valued cards being constantly broken by enemies. However, this is only scratching the surface of the importance of deck composition. Not only do you have to consider the cost and value of your cards, but also the order you place them in with the case of attack cards. Keyblade cards deal different amounts of damage depending on what order you place them in. There are even certain slights, such as Sonic Blade, that require to use different Keyblades to activate. It's decision making like this that keeps deck building consistently interesting to me. It requires a lot more thought and strategy than a lot of people give the game credit for, and it's very rewarding to build specialized decks depending on your scenario. This is a solid foundation for a battle system. The core mechanics on paper are very interesting and offer a lot of opportunities for player expression and customization. However, the fatal flaw with Chain of Memories lies in the fact that when all these ideas are put into practice, the design begins to crack. While there is a bit of a learning curve, once you get the hang of the general mechanics and how to properly build a deck, the game becomes extremely easy to break. This is for a few reasons. As you level up in Chain of Memories, you get the option as to what stat you want to prioritize. You can increase your maximum HP, raise the card point limit on your deck, and even learn new slights once you reach specific levels. The slights you can can learn from leveling up are quite frankly ridiculous, and it's shocking at how exploitable they are. Sonic Blade is one of the most notable examples of this. It's a pretty easy slight to activate, since it only requires three different attack cards that have the sum value of 20 to 23. This attack can stun lock most bosses, which means it's impossible for them to retaliate by playing a zero card. But if you really want to lay on the damage, then you use Lethal Frame. This slight freezes the enemy in place and deals massive damage. Sure, it has a lot of windup, but if you land 
land the first hit on the enemy, you can quickly load up another lethal frame during their hit stun. You can completely destroy boss battles with little effort by doing so. That's not all, because random encounters also eventually become a non-issue, thanks to slights such as Tornado and Mega Flare. The best slights in the game are the ones that can lock the enemy in hit stun, since it's easily exploitable. This is all assuming you have the right cards in your deck, but that's not entirely difficult to achieve thanks to how forgiving some of these slight requirements are. While it can be argued that these overpowered decks are a reward to the player for mastering the game's tools, I personally don't see it that way. Some of these decks are just far too powerful for how easy they are to create. Obviously, I could just disallow myself from using these powerful attacks, but if you need to put a self-imposed ban on slights, then there's an inherent problem with their design. However, I think I can offer a few pretty reasonable solutions that can, at the very least, make slights a bit more balanced. Enemy cards and Chain of Memories provide the player with passive buffs for a limited time. This can range from increasing the potency of magic cards to providing the player with auto life for one use. The card I want to focus on is the Genie Jafar boss card. You obtain this card by defeating Jafar at the end of Agrabah, which is one of the first worlds you can visit. This card makes it so the next 20 cards you play are unable to be broken by the enemy. I don't like this for a few reasons. The entire combat system is built around the idea of playing higher value cards than the enemy in order to interrupt their attacks. However, even if you play the highest value slight possible, there's always a chance it can be broken by a zero card. The Genie Jafar card is one of, if not, the best card in the game when building a deck, because it protects you from any consequences for spamming slights. There's not much you can change to fix a card like this other than allowing zeros to still cause a card break, so I think the best course of action would be to remove it from the game. The other change I'd like to suggest is limiting the number of times you could use a slight per battle. This could vary based on the power of the slight. Sonic Blade, for example, could only be activated twice or three times in a battle before the card combination would no longer work. A lot of card games limit how many copies of the same card you're allowed to have in your deck for the sake of balancing. I think that applying this rule to slights specifically would do the same without treading on the current form of deck building too much. This would encourage players to build decks around a wide variety of cards, since they wouldn't be able to rely on a single strategy to burst down enemies and bosses. While these aren't perfect solutions, I think that these suggestions would go a long way in ironing out the kinks. However, we're not quite done with talking about the combat of Chain of Memories, since Riku's campaign features a somewhat different take on the battle system. While some elements of Sora's combat are still present, there are enough differences to warrant taking a look. Riku's battle system puts a a much larger emphasis on the card breaking system. Whenever you break an enemy's card, you fill up a bit of the D gauge. When this is full, you'll enter Riku's dark mode. Not only does this increase his speed and attack strength, but it also allows him to perform slights, which is something he usually doesn't have access to. The catch with dark mode is that you'll revert back to normal if you take too much damage, or have your cards broken a certain number of times. That's not all of the differences either. Unlike Sora, Riku uses a predetermined deck for each world. While this may seem like a handicap at first, the trade off is that not only are deck reload speeds instant, but you also have access to all of your collected enemy cards at once. The final change made to Riku's combat is the dueling system. Whenever you play the same valued card as an enemy, you'll be able to challenge them to a duel. During a duel, your goal is to break the cards the enemy plays in quick succession, and if you're successful, you'll perform a powerful counterattack. With all of this considered, Riku's campaign does offer a fresh experience. However, I still prefer Sora's campaign at the end of the day for one major reason. One of my favorite favorite parts about Chain of Memories combat system is the deck customization. A lot of thought had to go into which cards you place into your deck, and there was a wide variety of strategies you can come up with. While it does have its issues, I think the player expression it offers more than makes up for its faults. The pre-made decks remove a lot of player choice, and I'm honestly not a big fan of this decision. Even though decks change every world, the only real difference lies in the numbered value of each attack card and the quantity of cards you have at your disposal. On the surface, these structured decks are a lot more balanced since the designers have control over what cards you have access to. For the most part, I would consider Riku's story more challenging, but that's mostly because he has no way of restoring HP outside of using a Mickey friend card. The problem is, much like with Sora's campaign, the game mechanics are easily exploitable. Dark Mode Riku's slights suffer from the same issues that Sora's do, meaning that you can stun lock and clear encounters with ease. The intent of the dueling minigame is for the players to memorize where their high value cards are located in their deck, so they can quickly counter whatever card is thrown at them. In practice, you can actually just mash your way through the minigame without consequences. Sure, you'll have to reload your deck when that happens, but it's hardly a punishment since it's done instantly. Because of this, most boss battles will follow one of two strategies. Either you abuse dark mode to spam powerful slights, or you counter every attack by activating the dueling minigame. The only boss that doesn't crumble from these exercises
exploits is Zexion, since his main gimmick revolves around stealing cards from your deck to use in his own attacks. This requires you to play more carefully, and engage with the boss in ways the game never really asks you to. I find this to be a nice change of pace, and wish that more bosses would do something like this. Strangely enough, cards aren't only used for combat, since world exploration also relies on them, albeit in a slightly different way. Due to the hardware limitations of the GBA, worlds are divided up into these compact square-shaped rooms. The main gimmick is that you're able to use map cards at the entrance of a room to generate the contents inside. You could do things such as increase the number of Heartless that spawn, create a shop to buy more cards, or even create rooms that modify card values. Something to keep in mind is that each room has a requirement to unlock. This can range from using a map card that's higher, lower, or equal to a specific value, the card color, or sometimes even a combination of both. Every time you clear an encounter, you'll earn a random map card. I've heard stories of people getting stuck because the proper map cards wouldn't drop. And while this personally never happened to me, the fact that progression can be halted at all due to luck is something that I have a problem with. Even if we exclude this design decision, I still can't say I'm a fan of the overworlds in this game. They're all extremely basic and lack any sort of character to set them apart. Worlds end up blending in with each other from a gameplay perspective, and other than some slight hazards, you end up traversing them all the same way. This is a lot more forgivable for the GBA version of the game due to the limitations of the hardware. I get that the PS2 remake is trying to stay as faithful as possible to the original game, but I think that more work should have gone into making map exploration interesting. There were only so many room layouts per world, and it's a lot more noticeable since Rechain of Memories was released on more powerful hardware. It's not exactly enough to ruin the game for me, but I would be lying if I said I liked this system. To summarize my thoughts on the gameplay of Chain of Memories, I think that there are a lot of interesting ideas here. Customizing your own deck is a lot of fun, and I do quite enjoy the basic rule set. However, it doesn't take long to realize that a lot of the more advanced mechanics are very easy to exploit, and since there's no reason not to abuse mechanics, this leads to an experience that ultimately becomes pretty dull near the end of a playthrough. While I did propose some solutions to make things a bit more balanced, the only way to truly fix a lot of this game's issues is to change things about the fundamental design. Chain of Memories is the only game in the series to use the card combat system, and while there is fun to be had with it, I can see why Square dropped it. With all of the gameplay stuff out of the way, all that's left for me to cover is the rest of the game's story. As a reminder, I'm going to be dishing out spoilers throughout the rest of this video, so if what you've seen has interested you, then I recommend you play the game yourself before watching the rest. With that out of the way, let's go into a bit more detail as to what's going on here. Chain of Memories is primarily concerned with planting the seeds and setting up characters for Kingdom Hearts 2. To give a quick reminder, the plot revolves around Sora, Donald, and Goofy searching Castle Oblivion in hopes of finding their friends. Throughout their journey, they run into members of this mysterious group known as Organization 13. At first, their goals are unknown, however, as the game progresses, the curtain is slowly pulled back. The one in charge of this operation is this pink-haired man named Marluxia. Marluxia plans on rebelling against his superior so he can overthrow him and take control of the organization for himself. In order to do so, he forces a young girl named Namine to use her memory-altering powers so that they can manipulate Sora into joining their cause. Over the course of the game, Namine erases Sora's old memories and implants fake ones onto him. She essentially inserts herself into Sora's life, and forces a young boy to become obsessed with her, while the organization does their best at selling this lie, even going as far as creating a fake Riku with implanted memories to battle Sora on occasion. The core of Sora's campaign focuses on how memories are linked to our identities. When Sora's newfound infatuation with Namine takes priority, his personality also takes a bit of a shift. While he still is a good-natured and caring person, we get to see the more ugly side of him that wasn't present in the first game. Sora gets angry at as friends, he becomes frustrated and confused as his mind is slowly warped by Namine. I find Namine as a character very interesting. Her origins aren't fully explained in this game, but to give the gist of it, she's being held captive by Organization 13 in Castle Oblivion because of her powers to alter Sora's memories. Knowing that if she disobeys, she'll be locked away in the castle, she reluctantly agrees to their plans. Namine is a very lonely person that lacks any real connections, and when she notices that Sora begins to care deeply for her after replacing his memories, she can't can't help but continue going through with it. There's a part of her that loves the attention she gets from Sora and the Riku replica, since it makes her feel like she has real friends, but at the same time, Namine is torn. She wants to have someone to care about and cares for her, but this would come at the price of stripping away Sora's free will. By the end of the game, she does make the decision to fix Sora's memories. However, this comes at the cost of him forgetting all about Castle Oblivion, the organization, and even Namine herself. While he does promise that he'll try to remember her, it's ultimately one that he can't keep. I like Namine's character. While she 
is technically an antagonist throughout the game, she isn't necessarily evil. All she wanted was a friend of her own, but it's the way she goes about doing so that ultimately makes her selfish. The last major plot element in the story is Organization 13. This game was their introduction, and they play a major role in Kingdom Hearts 2. In terms of how they're used in this game, I think that they're an okay set of bad guys that work well as an obstacle for our heroes to overcome. Characterization, on the other hand, is a bit of a mixed bag. Axel and Larxene are my favorite members of the group. They're the only ones that have discernible personalities, and are a ton of fun to watch whenever they're on screen. Larxene is a bit of a sadist that gets a kick out of tormenting Sora about Nominate throughout the game. Axel's got a lot of charisma, and the game constantly keeps you guessing as to where his true allegiance lies. The other members aren't bad per se, but they are somewhat unremarkable. I wish that there was more time spent developing the other organization members as individuals, because as they are now, they mostly exist as bosses that Sora and Riku cut down throughout the story. It wouldn't be until future games where some of these characters are fleshed out more, but that doesn't excuse the mostly flat characterization they have here. I find a lot of the plot in Chain of Memory is pretty compelling, but a critical flaw with the narrative narrative has to be its pacing. All the stuff I just mentioned involving Sora's memories, the organization, and Nominee's personal conflict all takes place in between the Disney World revisits. I defended the Disney Worlds in Kingdom Hearts 1 because I thought they were a lot more nuanced than people give them credit for. If you looked at every world individually, then you could see that some were more important to the main plot than others, but when looking at the broad strokes of what the Disney Worlds were trying to accomplish, I think that they did a good job at developing Sora's character and relationships in time for the end game. Chain of Memories attempts to do the same thing, but is far less successful in its execution. The underlying theme of the Disney worlds is memories. However, almost none of the stories within the worlds were altered to fit this new idea. What ends up happening is that most of the runtime in these worlds is spent experiencing abridged retellings of what happened in the first Kingdom Hearts game. Sure, lines are edited here and there to include a mention of memories, or to foreshadow an event in the main story, but it's done so sloppily that it comes off as a last minute Edition, and that's being generous because most worlds are exactly the same. The only world that feels thematically fitting is Wonderland. Just like in the original game, Alice is put on trial for a crime that she didn't commit, but this time, it revolves around the Queen of Hearts' stolen memories. The Cheshire Cat even foreshadows false memories, which are integral to the overarching narrative. The entire plot is based on the idea of Sora's memories being manipulated by Naminé and the organization, so it's such a missed opportunity to see that none of the Disney worlds take advantage of this concept. What if the content inside the Disney worlds changed as Nominee's grasp on Sora tightens? The early worlds can feel the same as their Kingdom Hearts 1 counterparts, but as the game goes on and Sora's memories are manipulated, major changes in the worlds can be introduced. Entire scenarios could be different because of Nominee's powers. Not only would this fit well thematically, but would also make the revisits feel less redundant. However, I do have to mention that the idea I suggested is somewhat utilized near the end of the game. The last couple of main worlds you've explore are the returning Destiny Island, and a new location known as Twilight Town. The former is the second to last world in the game, and by this point in the story, Sora has become so focused on Naminé that he's abandoned his friends, and is completely indifferent to his memories. Twilight Town, on the other hand, is framed as a memory from the other side of Sora's heart. In the context of this game, we're not entirely sure what this means, but let me just say that in hindsight, this is a very great piece of foreshadowing for Kingdom Hearts 2. These last two worlds highlight the potential that this concept had, and it's a shame that it went completely unutilized throughout most of the game. I understand that the Disney World exists for the sake of gameplay instead of the narrative, but it's disappointing to see them take such a back seat when the original game used them so well. If I were to look past the pacing issues, then I think that the story we have now is pretty decent, but it's not without its flaws. The organization members are pretty flat, and the stop and go pace of the story makes it hard to get into. But that doesn't mean that the core idea is flawed, and I find that there are enough highs to keep me engaged. Engaged. But this is only half of the equation. Riku's campaign is unlocked once you finish the game for the first time. His story is meant to fill in some of the gaps present in Sora's campaign, while also developing him further as a character. To give some context, after the events of the first Kingdom Hearts, Riku and King Mickey end up getting separated, and the young boy finds himself trapped between the realm of light and dark. Riku is guided by a mysterious voice to Castle Oblivion and is beckoned to go on a journey of self-discovery. The core of Riku's story is him facing the consequences for the 
mistakes he made in the last game, and learning to deal with his inner darkness, all the while he runs into members of the organization. This campaign is much shorter than Sora's, and while it does give some answers to elements concerning that story, the main focus is on Riku's personal struggle. I really like how this was handled. Riku's first reaction is to try to completely destroy the darkness in his heart, but when that doesn't work, he begins to learn to accept the mistakes he made, and weaponize the darkness so they can move forward into a better future. It's a much simpler story when compared to Sora's, but I think it works well for this character. However, much like Sora's story, the Disney worlds are completely inconsequential. In fact, they're even worse here since there are no cutscenes, and the worlds are significantly scaled down in size since you only need to fight the bosses to progress. It's draining to go through Riku's campaign since most of the actual gameplay content is filler. While he does get some exclusive boss battles against Lexius, Zexion, and Ansem, as well as exclusive mechanics to play around with, most of the content on offer is the same as Sora's at the end of the day. This makes fully completing Chain of Memories a bit of a drag, though necessary to get the full picture. Speaking of which, while the gameplay of Riku's campaign isn't that great, I find that the story on offer is rather well executed. It's a simple plot about learning to accept oneself and growing beyond past mistakes. The best demonstration of this happens near the end of the campaign. Riku ends up meeting Namine after the organization in Castle Oblivion is taken care of, and she offers to put Riku in the same comatose state as Sora and completely eradicate his inner darkness. After giving it some thought, Riku declines her offer, as this responsibility is his own to bear. Throughout the original game, Riku was manipulated into doing terrible things to others. Riku deciding to own up for his past actions and face the personification of his inner conflict is meant to show that Riku is starting to take back control of his life. While he still has to manage his heart's darkness, it's something that he no longer fears. By the end of the game, Riku sets off with King Mickey into parts unknown so they can begin their investigation on the rest of Organization 13, while Sora stays behind in Castle Oblivion in order to have his memories repaired. After the credits, we're given a tease of a mysterious blonde boy in Twilight Town, hinting at things to come in the future. And that's all for Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. Overall, I think that the game is just okay. The combat system is filled with a lot of creative and interesting ideas, but the game lacks polish in a lot of areas. Ideas that sound good on paper end up working against themselves and completely break the combat system. While there is fun that can be had with constructing a powerful deck, players that are looking for some sort of meaningful challenge or creative way to use their decks will be left wanting more. This stems from a fundamental level as well, meaning that a lot of changes would need to be made to balance things out. I like a lot of the story content that's featured here. We get the introduction to important concepts and characters that have a lasting impact on the series, and I think that the themes of memories and identity are solid. I just think that the execution of these ideas needed some more work. I wish that the story's major themes were better incorporated into the Disney worlds themselves, but the way things are now, the Disney worlds are so inconsequential that it drags down the pace of the original story that's being told here. At the same time, however, I do think that Chain of Memories does enough good to justify at least one playthrough. Go through Sora's campaign, and if you liked what you played, then I think you should also go through Riku's. If not, then you should at the very least watch the cutscenes. As I said at the start of the video, I have a very love-hate relationship with Chain of Memories, but just because something is flawed, that doesn't mean it isn't worth your time. Hey everyone, thanks for watching! I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. It's because of these lovely people that I'm able to make videos at the pace I do currently. These videos take a while to make, so if you're at all interested in helping out and donating, then you can do so through my Patreon or channel memberships. I have a few things I can offer in return, such as early video access, a special Discord role, and even some behind the scenes content on occasion. Every donation helps, and if these rewards sound interesting to you, then you can find out more by following the links in the description. At the time of this recording, November is just starting, which means that SMT5 is just around the corner. I plan on ending the year with a long-form review of the game, but on top of that, I was thinking of doing an unscripted first impressions discussion video with a few other content creators. I think it would be a fun experiment and a good way to get my initial thoughts out in the wild before the official review. For all of my Kingdom Hearts fans in the audience, while I do plan on covering all of the games eventually, there will be a bit of a wait for the Kingdom Hearts 2 video. If you want to stay up to date regarding future content on the channel, then I suggest you follow my Twitter and join my Discord server. Both links will be in the description. And while you're down there, why not leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Once again, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.